Uh, I'm Lawrence Weschler. I am the uh, curator with Quilt Jones of this festival. Uh, as you probably know by now, this is a five-day festival about uh, James Baldwin this time. It is our second annual uh, festival here at, at Live Arts. Uh, these festivals are about embodied ideas. Last year, what we did, Oliver Sacks, the world's of Oliver Sacks, it was kind of mind body. This time it's body politic, body soul. But it's uh, incredibly uh, invigorating for us to be working on the legacy of James Baldwin, who really is one of the great, great, most salient, most pertinent voices of the 20th century. Um, as you know, we have all sorts of things going on here while I'm here. The whole festival launches uh, the year of James Baldwin, which is a collaboration with the Columbia University School of the Arts and Harlem Stage and some other places. We're going to be hearing all sorts of great Baldwin programming all through the year. Um, and uh, each day at noon, some of you were already there this morning, uh, we're holding Baldwin University, Baldwin 101, and uh, having great readers reading for free. Uh, outside, you have the free Hank Willis Thomas five screen video. You should definitely watch. We'll be there through uh, through uh, Memorial Day, as will the mural of the New Yorker upstairs, in which uh, the fire next time first appeared. Um, today, or right now, we're going to be having uh, one of the programs I've been most looking forward to, which is about the relation between uh, James Baldwin and Buford Delaney. Uh, we have the premier biographer of both of them, David We have uh, Rachel Cohen, whose book, A Chance uh, Meeting, um, you will, she's going to read from it and you'll get a sense of how terrific that book is, and I really commend it to you. All three of those books I've just mentioned. And uh, Deirdre Harris Kelly is also here uh, with the Roman Bearden uh, uh, Foundation. And we don't do more by the introduction because you have it right there in your piece of paper. But we get them out here, and here they are. Thank you so much. Oh, one other thing, by the way, these are actual paintings by Buford uh, Delaney, and they are courtesy of the Jim Lemus Gallery, and he is here, so anybody who wants to buy them at the end of this should watch it. Somebody should. <laughs> Across his bare white studio to open the door. 
The young man shifted slightly as the door opened, an eager half-smile on his face. The lady thought he was beautiful, narrow and quick, all desire and hope of love. Buford Delaney looked long and hard. James Baldwin later wrote that it felt rather like being x-rayed, and invited him in. In 1940, Baldwin was a senior at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, and he had been, um, he'd been a sort of prodigy of the church. He wanted to outdo his father, a lay preacher, but had wisely chosen to preach before a different congregation, which may have been the only reason the senior Baldwin could tolerate his son's success. Baldwin's other allegiance besides preaching was to school, and um, he, um, he had as a high school French teacher, Kevin Cullen. I wish Kevin Cullen had been my high school French teacher. Um, and, this, um, and he encouraged Baldwin in his writing talent. This is also where Baldwin met Richard Avedon, the subject of another panel here um, as part of this festival. Um, and Baldwin and Avedon together were the editors of their high school literary magazine, The Magpie. Um, his friends suspected somewhat before Baldwin did that the church was not the place um, for um, revelation for him. Um, and he had a friend, Emil Kapoya, who knew Delaney and who uh, arranged the introduction for him to come down. At this apartment, Buford Delaney had a lot of visitors. Alfred Stieglitz came, and so did George O'Keefe and Henry Miller. Um, Ethel Water stopped by, and the actor Canada Lee. Delaney kept his paintings covered with white sheets. He liked the way Stieglitz is an American place look, with its white walls and bare floor, and he had set up the studio the same way. He could usually, although not always, be persuaded to uncover his canvases. In this case, he might have volunteered. People said that the paintings of Delaney's Green Street period, the jumble of buildings and fire hydrants, the angular streets, the insistent reds and greens and yellow, were a bracing surprise in the white studio. Maybe you could show number three now. Delaney was one of the first black people Baldwin could remember encountering who didn't live in Harlem, and certainly the first artist he'd met who didn't feel his material was confined to, quote, black life. Baldwin always associated this first meeting with the old song, Lord, Open the Unusual Door. As for Delaney, he was watching Baldwin's expressive face react to every detail and painting him in his mind. Baldwin eventually sat for nearly a dozen portraits by Delaney, including a nude called Dark Rapture. This would be number 11. One of very few nudes Delaney did in a painting that helped him move toward abstraction. <coughs> they weren't lovers, but there were times when Delaney was in love with Baldwin. Um, maybe number 10. When he walked through Buford Delaney's door, James Baldwin was as much in need of a father as a lover. Not too long before this visit, Baldwin had brought one of his black high school friends home, and this had, um, this had created a huge fight with his father um, over the subject of religion in front of Jewish. And, um, and Baldwin, after this encounter, wrote that he felt the death of a merciless resolve to kill my father rather than, than to allow my father to kill me. There, in, in Baldwin's life, um, as we'll be able to hear more from David Lee, um, uh, there were always there were always multiple father figures, and um, if um, if his own father step it was actually his stepfather um, was the subject of violent feelings, the Relationship with the lady was much more, um, uh, much more communicative and much more um, nurturing. Um, Baldwin's father was a uh, stepfather was institutionalized, and um, uh, he died in an institution in July of 1943. Um, uh, Baldwin's youngest sister was born on that same day, and Baldwin, who had wanted to be loved by his father at least as much as he wanted to kill him, took a long time to recover from his relief and guilt and grief. Um, and there was also that night one of the worst race riots in Harlem's history. And the next day, the family drove through the body to the bur drove the body to the burial ground through streets of shattered storefronts. And that Baldwin was drunk. Um, Buford Delaney helped Baldwin to find a way to cover the expenses of the funeral, which in a way formalized Delaney's position in Baldwin's life. Baldwin often referred to Delaney as my spiritual father. For the next five years, Baldwin and Delaney saw each other all the time. Um, Baldwin moved down to the village, and they both frequented Kami's Calypso. They sat up all night next to Delaney's Victrola, um, and um, uh, they went to costume parties. There was something of the mystic about Delaney. His friends regarded him as a kind of minor deity, and um, his stories and observations often had the quality of parables. Baldwin told the story again and again of standing on Broadway and being told by Delaney to look down. 
Delaney asked him what he saw, and Baldwin said, a puddle. Delaney said, look again. And then Baldwin saw the reflections of the buildings, distorted and radiant in the oil of the puddle. He taught me to see, Baldwin said, and that what one cannot or will not see says something about you. So I, I wanted to kind of open the discussion of the New York kind of time by asking if you would say, David, a little bit about um, uh, kind of life in that moment, what, what downtown meant to Delaney and Baldwin, what Delaney meant to Baldwin arriving there. Yeah, um, if I can start by just saying something about the seeing, because that's yeah. so important. It seems to me that um, Baldwin took that lesson with him throughout his life. Uh, it really had to do with the isolation in the village which uh, both Baldwin and, and the lady found themselves. Uh, that is, they, they were not in the majority in the village. Uh, in, a, in a racial context. And Baldwin saw that image of seeing that Buford taught him as the basis for the whole question of race in America. Um, it's, it's difficult to uh, express it, but Baldwin said, don't look at me as a category, see me. If you can't see me, you can't love me. If you can't love me, we can't be together. And not love in a Hallmark card sense, but in the sense, uh, I suppose, that, uh, or what we mean when we say God is love, let's say. Uh, in other words, Baldwin insisted that you see me and that I see him, not a category. I'm only black because you think you're white, he once said uh, to an audience. Uh, so seeing became very, very important. Mm -hmm. And he used that very physical picture which uh, Delaney was giving him. You know, you've got to see more physically as an artist, as a plastic artist. But Baldwin took that into a much larger category having to do with being a human being and a writer. Mm -hmm. But uh, as, as far as their lives in the village at that time is concerned, they were both... Uh, they were both on a kind of uh, journey. And they were on a kind of dangerous journey from that point of view. Buford could have lived in Harlem. Uh, he began his, his life in New York by living in Harlem, but uh, decided he didn't want to be seen as, quote, in those days, a Negro artist. He wanted to be seen as an artist. Baldwin came to the village for the same reason and eventually went to Paris for the same reason, because he wanted to be not a Negro writer, but a writer. Uh, both of them, for various reasons, given the historical realities of the next 25 years, had little choice but also to become black painter and black okay. writer. We can talk about that yeah, in the context of Paris. Yeah, maybe we can show a couple of slides yeah. from that period. That's what I was thinking mm -hmm. about. Great. Maybe two through, mm -hmm. two through five? Yeah. The rest on five? That sounds good. This is a self portrait um, by Lucas Delaney from about 1944. I think, yeah. Of which he did many during the course of his life. Uh, self portrait. He liked doing self portraits. Yeah. So. Born in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, trained at an early age by um, I'm an American impressionist, um, which I find really interesting <laughs> um, because um, it's very classical training um, for a young person like um, Buford. I believe he was 23 when he was working with um, Lloyd Branson. And at, at his suggestion, went on to Boston. And uh, we were talking earlier about the kind of, um, you know, formal versus informal training he may have gotten in Boston and elsewhere. Um, and it's always interesting, I think, to think about why artists, um, you know, what they call themselves in terms of um, whether the, their level of training. So um, just as introduction, I am a painter by trade. I'm, I'm, 
here, not representing the Romy Bearden Foundation, um, um, think that I'm here because I'm a, I'm a painter and, um, you know, I feel like my role could be to sort of look, really look at these paintings. So much is said about art um, and about artists' lives. And um, I always like to look at the actual work um, and just think about how we learn from paintings through um, the writings, through the biography and all of that, but that we really learn the most by looking. Um, and so when I think about the paintings of this period, and I know that he is thinking, looking at Matisse, he's looking at particularly Cezanne um, and these other um, you know, European uh, impressionists that he's breaking up space. Um, when, you know, when you think about how a writer like Baldwin may be impressed by an artist, a visual artist, um, I always think about how much we learn from the Impressionists um, because they really exploded space and light in a way that we will never, we, we could never turn back from. Um, it is such a, such a lesson learned because Baldwin um, also talks about him teaching him about light. And so I think too about, you know, even the light artists of the 60s and how, you know, suddenly the inc incandescent bowl was a way of expressing something in space that none of us had really even looked at. Like, yeah, we use bulbs, we, we're working with bulbs, we, this is the way that we see, because light is the way that we see as an artist or as any, I mean, if we turn up all the lights, there's nothing that can be defined. Light defines things. And so when I look at Buford's paintings of this period, I, I see an artist who is, can we see the next one, the, the next, very next one? Um, and the next one, you know, trying to, trying to um, identify for himself where his role is. I mean, this is, the, this is the, the role of art, really, is to find identity for the artist. And so, you know, he is taking everything he learns and trying to find um, a way to go. And then if you look at the next painting, I believe, yeah. yeah. You know, this is really interesting because, um, you know, I mean, you can put a lot of metaphors on this, like isolationists. Um, you know, that each of those little areas are outlined by black lines. It's a heavy black line, and he's trying to really find the definition. Whereas with the Impressionists, you know, the, you don't hardly see any lines because the color, the bits of color make up the edges. And so I like to talk about edges being exploded versus being held. And, um, and so, you know, also what I get from this is a lot of energy. Here he's, you know, participating in, uh, you know, many of the kinds of um, topics that artists in Harlem, Harlem Renaissance artists, were exploring. But he's creating a type of energy because color is so important and so vibrant all the way through his work um, that this is what he's focused on, this energy. And even with the later abstract works, the thing you get from it is energy. Um, so it's almost like you see the aura around um, the heads and, and the way that he does even portraits. You see a slight aura around the head and it has to do with the, the way that he approaches edges. Um, so, you know, here is a scene of musicians and very active, and so it's very different from the one that we saw just before because it's a different scene, it's a different kind of energy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, that's, I think that's really helpful and goes together with David, what you were saying about sight, and um, there's a way in which. Um, Delaney was thinking about light, the actual light that the artist is using to kind of interpret the world, and again, maybe Baldwin was thinking about light or in a metaphorical right. way as a kind of, as the way that one saw through to the world of other people and the kind of way that people could be in relation with each other, kind of coming into the light. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, that connection. Um, again, seeing light 
uh, that, Jane, that uh, Baldwin's favorite writer was of all people, Henry James. Yeah. And what he liked about Henry James, not only was the long convoluted sentences, somebody said he used lots of commas, so did Baldwin. <laughs> lots of um, but Baldwin once said to me that uh, the reason he loved Henry James is that Henry James was the first American writer to see through our own myths to reality. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to break through those barriers. Again, see, uh, stop thinking in categories and see, see. reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because light reveals something for yeah. you. It's, a, it's yeah. a sort of looking at the truth. Um, even again with the dark room, if you're walking around and you don't know what's there because you can't see it, when you turn on the light that you see a sort of truth about yeah. objects <laughs> in yeah. your way, you know. Um, yeah. But it would be interesting to just go a little bit further on this idea of, you know, him living downtown and going mm -hmm. uptown. I mean, what, what was that like? I mean, I know that um, there were issues with him and, you know, his very religious background um, and being homosexual and, you know, I mean, were there issues with living downtown and being uptown? We're talking about Buford now. Yeah, we're talking about Buford, yes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, part of the reason for living downtown was a kind of escape from mm -hmm. these things. It was more difficult, mm -hmm. in a way, for him to live in Harlem. Also, he didn't really want to be part of a group. Mm -hmm. So the Harlem Renaissance is sort of coming to the end. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, there were it was the Artists' Union in Harlem and so on. And he did get involved with WPA works. He helped with the Harlem Hospital mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. murals. Uh, but essentially, he wanted to live his own life. And he was always that way. And he was that way in Paris. He was that way in New York. Uh, he did not want to be part of a group. He wanted to be viewed for Delaney, um, which is interesting, because he was a very shy person. He was. Um, in many ways, a very withdrawn person. Well, maybe that isn't so surprising. Yeah, it's a good point. But George mm -hmm. O'Keefe says that when you meet Buford, you never see anyone else like him. Like his dynamic, he had a, a sort of dynamic personality. He certainly did. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like it was like being uh, with a philosopher, um, but a very different kind of philosopher than anyone you've ever met before or read about. Uh, he was uh, he was saintly somehow. Uh, I don't know how to explain it otherwise? And you knew that immediately. Uh, and later on, I'll read a section of my own book, uh, which uh, is a is a discussion of or is a description of the first day I met him. Mm -hmm. And I think that will answer your question actually better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One one more thing that maybe is helpful. Um, before we move on to the Paris, the Paris section, is just to just to get a little view of Baldwin as he, the young Baldwin arriving in this in this environment. Um, maybe could you show twelve and thirteen? Kind of, yeah, um, these are portraits that um, um, Delaney made of of the young Baldwin, and then thirteen and fourteen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, maybe 14 now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think some of the things that you both have been saying about what Delaney, uh, Delaney brought out in the world, the way that around him the world seemed to be somewhat reorganized and to, and to look different and to have a, an unusual vividness and light, um, that all of those things were enormously important to Baldwin arriving Arrive, trying to arrive in the next part of his life, you know, a young, a young artist who didn't yet know what, what kind of an artist he might be able to be. Um, it matters so much to see somebody who's kind of struck out on their own individual and odd path and uh, maybe gave him a chance to, to think beyond, beyond Harlem in a way. I, I think that's where the image and the metaphor of the unusual door comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, Buford loved to sing that song. Uh -huh. um, Lord opened the unusual door, but um, Baldwin felt that when the door opened, and I would feel that many years later when I met the lady, you see, 
that he was opening the door into another world, and that's what you felt, and that's what he felt. Mm -hmm. And metaphorically for Baldwin, this meant the possibility of escape for him, too, because for different reasons, he needed to escape from Harlem. He needed to escape from racial definition. Mm -hmm. He needed to escape from a, essentially a cruel and abusive father. And he needed to escape from a religion which wasn't taking him anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so he found, you might say, a new religion um, in Buford's open door, coming into that door. He heard Bessie Smith. He had always been told that Bessie Smith was obscene, that the that blues were dirty, uh, that it was only gospel that was good. But Delaney taught him taught him that uh, Bessie Smith was as holy uh, as gospel, uh, and opened the door for him. Opened the door for him to become a writer, which involved his leaving something and finding something new, mm -hmm. and finding a new audience. Both of them were looking not for one part of the, one segment of America as their audience, mm -hmm. but, as, but as looking at the world as their audience, in a sense. Yeah. 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 I guess we should move on to Paris. It's, that seems nice. Oh, we'll go to Paris. Um, and, um, and so I'm going to read again a little bit of um, uh, my distillation of this, of this very complicated and interesting relationship and then continue. After a few years, James Baldwin realized that if he stayed in New York, he might not, quote, survive the fury of the color problem. And he managed to leave for Paris. He had received a Rosenwald Fellowship for which Delaney had recommended him. The Rosenwalds owned a number of Delaney's, which gave Delaney hope that he too would be given a stipend, but they turned his application down. And that, unfortunately, is sort of representative of the way that patronage worked for Delaney. It was always giving and taking away, kind of simultaneously, I think. Um, Baldwin went to Paris without him. From Paris, Baldwin eventually published Go Towns on the Mountain and Notes of a Native Son, uh, the title of which he kind of uh, took from uh, again, two fathers, uh, uh, Richard Wright, um, who maybe he sometimes didn't want to kill, and um, Henry James, Notes of a Son and Brother. Um, Baldwin read Henry James for the first time in Paris, um, and, um, and I, I will read the quote that, um, that David Leary referred to recently. Um, this, um, this is a, a thing that Baldwin said um, about Henry James uh, late in his life. Um, he said that what drew him most to James, maybe uh, maybe this comes, I think, directly from me, was the way the earlier writer had considered, quote, the failure of Americans to see through to the reality of others. Um, perhaps when he said this, he was thinking of the men who had taught him to see. Like Henry James, James Baldwin was always his father's son. Buford Delaney's studio was freezing cold. He earned almost nothing from his art. He taught a little, and he had various odd jobs. If he ever sold a painting or got a small grant, within a few days, he had given all the money away to other people who seemed hungrier than he was. His mental illness got progressively worse. After Baldwin left New York, Delaney drank more to keep the voices at bay. In 1953, a wealthy friend offered to buy Delaney a ticket to go to Paris. The trip across the Atlantic was one of the few times in his life that he could remember eating three meals a day. When he got off the train in Paris, he was very disoriented. Travel and moving were upsetting for him. Some of his worst breakdowns came when he was alone in a new place. Um, Delaney had forgotten to wire Baldwin about his arrival. Some people he met on the boat took him to a hotel, and the next day he happened to walk by the cafe floor. Baldwin caught sight of him, screamed, ran across the street, and threw himself into Delaney's arms. Paris liberated Delaney as an artist and became his city. He went back to the United States only once, in 1969, to visit his family at Christmas. In Paris, he went to museums, he met Picasso. Like many American painters, he moved into complete abstraction, although he always painted portraits. Um, he had an almost religious relationship to the color yellow, and Baldwin wrote that in front of a Delaney painting, quote, we stand in the light, which is both loving and merciless. They were great proponents of love, Delaney and Baldwin. Delaney wrote in his journal, love, when unimpeded, realizes the miraculous. Both men held to that possibility and worked to make it true in their art, despite the fact that both were unlucky in love, or anyway loved men who couldn't love them back, or couldn't love them enough, or couldn't stay with them. Baldwin initially found it wonderful to be treated in France as an American writer, and without some of the 
um, baggage that he had experienced in New York, but eventually he noticed how the French behaved toward the Algerians in Paris, and the struggle for civil rights was intensifying, and Baldwin thought, quote, there are no untroubled countries in this fearfully troubled world. And he borrowed money from his friend Marlon Brando, and he went back to the United States, but he went back and forth, always between Europe and America, um, and it, it was important in returning to Europe to be able to see Delaney. Delaney was very proud of Baldwin. Sometimes, when he was a little wistful, oh, would you show um, 34 and 42 so that we can see Delaney in abstraction? Uh, we'll get more of these. This is a portrait of Baldwin. Um, and 42, I think, is a purely abstract. Yeah. <coughs> Delaney felt that at least he had helped Baldwin to succeed in things that he had found impossible. Um, the painter had trouble feeling comfortable with his own sexuality, and he loved the openness of Baldwin's novel about two men together, Gianna's room. And Delaney had struggled to find a way to make the beauty of introspective work serve the political needs of Harlem. He felt Baldwin achieved this in Notes of the Native Son, The Fire Next Time, and No Name in the Street, which he was moved to have dedicated to him. Um, in the last part of Delaney's life, which this sort of uh, jumps to the end, we haven't, we haven't come, we won't come to that, but um, I want you to see the pictures of that. Um, uh, he, he became quite ill, and he was in and out of um, institutions. Um, it was a bitter irony of James Baldwin's life that he lost both his fathers to insanity. He wouldn't have called it a coincidence. He thought the reasons paranoia came easier to black Americans were straightforward. People got worn down by hunger and despair, fear of winter and policemen. For Baldwin, the last visits to Delaney in the hospital were disquietingly reminiscent of his own father's end. If you would show 44. Someone took a heartbreaking picture of the two of them standing together on the lawn of the institution, Delaney fragile and withdrawn, his eyes a little wild, white hair and beard standing out around his face, was tiny next to Baldwin, who held Delaney's hand but didn't quite look at him, as if he couldn't quite bear to see. Delaney was buried in Paris. Baldwin was in France at that time, but he didn't go to the funeral. He later said that this was his worst moment, that he had succumbed to the rage of a child who was angry with his father for leaving him. Um, you might also look at number 20, don't you think? Uh, yeah. With a happier time. Let's please have number 20. Yeah. There we are. There is a Paris moment. And in fact, I wanted to return to that for one last image, which is um, uh, that Baldwin and Delaney had some wonderful times when they lived together in Paris, and especially um, there was one summer when they lived in a little house in Cremar. And they, in, in that time, they, uh, they worked, and uh, I think you said Baldwin cooked the meals. And they talked, and in the evenings they sat by the large window facing the back garden and watched the light fade out of the dark blue sky. So now we, have, we can think of Paris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe, um, maybe David, if you would say a little bit about kind of what, the, what that meant to them to sort of be in another place, and then we're going to move on to the video. Yeah. Well, again, it was a, the parallel would be going from Harlem to Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. The next step is to go from Greenwich Village <coughs> to Paris. Paris, of course, has a kind of mythological context for African Americans anyway, as, as a place to go to, a place to find a kind of freedom. I mean, that's the image. Um, an image which is complicated by things like the Algerian uh, problem, but basically, mythologically, it was the place to go. And uh, I think they both found a tremendous joy in being in Paris. Uh, there's that wonderful, I don't think I can find it right now, but there's the story of Buford landing in or the ship coming to the Arc and then is taking the train and being just overwhelmed by what he saw as the light of Paris. And then Throughout the rest of his life, he used the image of light again to emphasize the idea of seeing. Uh, in Paris, he could see, and in Paris, people could see him until, of course, his voices, which were voices from the past, voices from his racial past, from, his, from the pain of his childhood, until they caught up with him and then undermined his life even in Paris. But there was always this tension in Paris between this new freedom, this 
being in the light, which to him was religious, as I think one of you said. It was a religious light, um, but it was always tempered by the pain of the past, the pain of memory, the pain of growing up in Knoxville, the pain of being uh, abused by society, just as Baldwin had been abused by his own father and by society. Does that lead to the, the Paris discussion of the yeah, video? Yeah, if, if we can play the video clip, what, what you'll see is a clip of um, James Baldwin, and um, it's a round table discussion with Romeo Bearden, um, Alvin Ailey, Albert Murray, um, and Baldwin sitting talking about you know, being artists in Paris and um, what that experience <coughs> meant to them. I thought it would be good to see them speaking and, and talking so you can get a sense of um, what they thought in retrospect. This film was actually done in the 70s and the round table was organized as part of the film. Yeah. <laughs> Being in France in the fifties, I mean, I was in school. I was in school in, in, in Los Angeles City College. And were, you, were you able to? Were you able to write? Were you able to absorb? No, I got a perspective on my yeah. experience, yeah. which I haven't had before. I could put it together. Uh, a simple thing like penetrating the menu in a restaurant and realizing what they were saying. You would take all that. Mm -hmm. Hoity toity stuff up and know that's what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. This is the grain that they're making such and such a reason. Mm -hmm. This is when they drop this on the this is the 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 how mm -hmm. it really worked mm -hmm. and what the dynamic exactly. of processing uh, just everyday elements of culture into fine art, what that happened to be. Mm -hmm. And I could see that, I could see down home cooking in terms of the concept of cuisine. But what I was talking about is absolutely true because, in fact, you know, the, the, to decipher the sort of that you did and you began the menus, you know, the, the bread and butter, you know, how in the world are you, are you going to, to survive? You know, to, uh, how do you order uh, what turns out to be a pork chop? You know? mm -hmm. And what is this man saying? Mm -hmm. I, I know when Romy talks about not being able to paint in Paris, Paris is really a painter's city, you know. But if you're an American writer in Paris, if you're not anyway, an um, American black writer in Paris. You live in an island in a real um, silence, you know, a real vacuum. But I was actually accurate because in that silence, I began to hear another language. You know, I began to hear French, and I began to decipher it in a way, which allowed me to go back. This is what we spent the summer talking about. Really, mm -hmm. Which allowed me to hear for the first time. You know. I was a storm of, you know, my 24 years here before I, before I split. It allowed me to hear my father and behind my father, my grandmother, and the church I came out of and the pulpit I just left, you know, to get back to what I had been before, you know, before I was seven years old. I could not do it in, in, in the streets where I was running, you know, running trucks for the garment center. But it's very important that you, Romy, Al, myself, are speaking about a voyage which you had to make seemingly far away to come full circle, to, to redeem a tradition which, is, which was not yet called a tradition because it wasn't written down except by Bessie Smith and Duke Ellington and so forth, mm -hmm. you know, and by preachers like my father, you know. Yeah. And in the vacuum of Paris, in, in, in my case, in your case, you know, I began I think, yeah, begin to understand my father's sermons and my own. It's impossible to describe the role of the church in this. You know, it would take a long, long time to do that. But I think, you know, it's always struck me that that of that church, which we, after all, were forced in a way to accept, you know. And no one, no one, it seems to me, is other, it's one thing the black people did with it was to recognize all the symbols we were given. Mm -hmm. Birth, resurrection, death, no. When I met Romy, I didn't associate him with the, um, the type of thing that was as close to 
the hope or let's say protest as such. And you got these two things of a kind of trauma of another writer. He, all this was a natural part of his sensibility. He started out in terms with, with political awareness and with political. Yeah. Um, that comes from a film um, titled Bearded Plays Bearded, which has um, recently been commercially packaged. And that segment was not in the film, it was cut from the film. But um, the filmmakers added it um, as a special feature to the DVD packet. So that's some rare, wonderful um, footage. Uh, I wanted to look at the, this piece up close. For those um, folks, I hope you get a chance to come and look at this picture. Um, it's an amazing painting that is still completely fresh and beautiful, I'm sure, as the day he made it. Um, but we have the number maybe 33. 33. Does not compare at all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are no other yeah. yeah. slides at yeah. this moment. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think that this is, um, you know, a beautiful place to start when you think about, um, you know, Bearden and his typical portraits of um, Baldwin and um, the, the famous yellow that's talked about over and over again. And this is, this is the other thing. It's like a lot of words are said about artists' work. And I don't think enough is, is um, said about how we actually experience the, are experiencing them when we go to the museum. So I, I'm always trying to be like that, even though I have an art background, I'm always trying to be that person who doesn't know anything. You know, like I'm a, you know, I just want to go in and I'm going to look at what's in front of me. I want to actually um, look at what he's doing with the edges. And what you can't see is that this painting is very abstract. I know it looks representational, but it could be more abstract to me. Um, when you look very closely at the um, underpainting in his skin, and you look at the, the depth of the paint that's on this canvas, you realize how much is underneath and what's really going on um, and how much it's worked um, and how much history goes into a painting like this. History literally, you know, from a couple of months, you work on a painting, and then it has a history when you go back to it um, two months later or three months later or a year later. It just depends on how long you're working on it. And, um, and so, you know, it's very interesting to look at the way that, you know, Buford does his eyes. Um, you know, I know in a wonderful, on your blog, okay. you um, talked about the eyes yeah. don't have it. Um, but it's, it's a piercing um, object graphic element in all of the works, all of the portraits. It's all about eyes, and it's about a way of seeing, and yeah. he talks about the light in the yellow. And an artist, I go in, and I know this about Buford. I've read about it, I've read about the yellow and the spiritual value. Um, but, but as a painter, yellow is a pretty irritating color. It's, um, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, you have to work very much with it, and so, um, you know, I, I started thinking about my reactions to yellow, and I thought it might be nice just to, to talk about the actual psychology of yellow, um, just for a little bit of fun while we're looking at this piece, while we're meditating on this piece, um, how yellow can actually be perceived as a childish color um, for men. Um, yet yellow is not a color that should be used when marketing products to prestigious or wealthy men, um, because it makes them feel childish. Um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, when you call someone yellow or yellow belly, it is calling them a coward. Not quite sure how that works. That's more about language, I think. Um, mellow yellow for just being laid back and not really um, feeling. But when you look at this, and when you look at this, I feel anything but laid back. I'm feeling energy. I'm feeling that he is looking at this man as he's you know, posing for him. And he's feeling energy come bouncing off his head. And he loses 
his head in the sea of yellow. And I think about their, both of their religious backgrounds and the sort of awe-inspiring of the church. You know, you go into a church and it's this very sort of low light situation and you are, and it's huge, it's a, it's a huge facility that you're made to feel, you're meant to feel small in because you are in the honest of, um, of God. And just a, a few more things about yellow. I mean, I, I think if it's overused, um, it's, it's known to be disturbing, to have a disturbing effect that you're not supposed to paint babies' rooms yellow because they can become disturbed. Um, <laughs> uh, although the color also uh, relates to acquired knowledge. Um, and so that definitely is something that maybe, um, you know, Buford is feeling about Baldwin. Um, it's, a, it's a creative mental space, yellow. Um, so that would make sense. Um, and you can go so on and on and on and on about all of these uses of yellow. But for me, it's, it's about contrast and vibrating energy and um, a sort of religious honest to the, the heavy use of that hue. Yeah. There's another th thing about this painting, I think, and about yellow. Uh, Buford saw yellow as his French color. He saw that yellow as, as light, and light was his religion, in a way. So when you talk about the religious aspect, of yeah. it, it's very much there. Mm -hmm. Also the fact that this is a portrait of James Baldwin, but it really isn't. Right. Uh, it's a portrait of a man. James Baldwin happened to sit before mm -hmm. him, and he may have seen James Baldwin in a kind of religious light, mm -hmm. as somebody who sees just the eyes, but it's, it's that, it's, it's the metaphor for something, someone who sees. When I look at that painting, I know he's looking at me. I know he's seeing something, and that's what the painting is about. Right, um, and you know, maybe this is a good time to talk about his back and forth on um, figurative yeah. versus abstraction. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to show the next one, whatever number that is. Uh, 34 yes. is, is also a portrait of Baldwin, but in a different... different um, I guess I was thinking of the um, abstract. This, this one is called the Sage Black. Yeah. And um, the abstract ones are uh, uh, another an example might be 42, uh, 41 or 42. Oh, that you want the yes, abstract right here, right here, right here. Yeah. 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 Um, where if, again, um, this could be an exploded view of what's happening behind the painted um, surface of this. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I think about artists going back and in the length of their career, going back and forth between abstraction and, you know, oftentimes it's not about that person. That person, that sitter, right. is, is something to hang the paint on. You know, um, as soon as you take it away from Photography, well, even photography can be very abstract. But once you put it on the canvas and it's a two-dimensional thing, it's abstract. Yeah. It's an abstracted view of something. And so I feel very much like um, that's a non-discussion for me when, when people ask about you know, artists going back and position. forth. Yeah. Because it is, it is whatever you want to do that gets you to that place of whatever you're thinking about at that time. And often it's, it is not about the figure. Um, even with a painter like Bearden, it, it was you know something to hang the the work on, something to hang the art and you know the objects. I'm not saying these don't have emotional value. No one tweet that, please. But what I'm saying is that oftentimes that's a non-question for me. Yeah. Forty-three is a good example. Yeah, yeah. There's also a portrait of Baldwin that right. does. All right. This, yeah. yeah. This is a portrait of Baldwin done in '66 or '67. And uh, you're right, the painting, I wish we could see the real portrait, yeah. because the painting, is, it's like that yellow. The yellow is, is one of his great yellow abstractions, and he uses that to hang this picture of Baldwin, which again, it doesn't matter that it's Baldwin. It's a man, uh, and you can make what you will of it. But look at the eyes, one higher than the other, uh, the disheveled mouth, and so on. It's a very different uh, vision of humanity than that one. 
And it's also about the mark making. Yes. Um, we go back to that last abstraction. It's about it's about an all over mark making. This sort of coalesces into something that we recognize as shapes, but it's it's more about the mark making. And I, again, I'll talk about edges because as an artist, you don't always know where your edges are. And this is a prime example of um, sort of not quite being in between those two spaces. Yeah, yeah. Dave, you, you were going to tell us the story of the other painting yeah. that we're on stage with. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear that. Well, it's an interesting... Um, there was a little argument that uh, Delaney and Baldwin had. It has to do... It goes back to the Richard Wright uh, protest novel discussion between Baldwin and Wright. Well, by the time the, the, the Wright's movement had, had, had gone into full gear, Baldwin had obviously become a civil rights spokesperson, uh, as well as a writer. And you could argue that he'd become a protest writer, too, in his essays. Um, and he once apparently told James Jones that he was disappointed that Buford never seemed to paint about the civil rights situation, that maybe he didn't feel it. And Baldwin heard this by, or rather, Buford heard this by the grapevine and was devastated. Uh, that, that his Jimmy should say to him, that, or should say about him, that he wasn't interested in the movement. Uh, so he started painting a series of paintings about Rosa Parks. So me again, like this, is it really Rosa Parks, or is it what Rosa Parks represents? So again, you have the yellow, abstract, heavy impasto painting in the background, and then he put a bench and he did a whole series of these, maybe four or five. Sometimes Rosa Parks in the red is sitting alone on the bench, sometimes in the middle of the bench, as if to say, in fact, as Buford did say on the back of one of them, I won't be moved. Uh, or sometimes she's sitting with a white woman who's carrying a baby, as if to say something about that. We can both sit on this bench, and the baby too. Um, it was Buford's way of commenting. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I think you mentioned the background has a kind of southern feeling to it. And it's a, near the time when Buford, in fact, went back to the uh, to south in yeah. Huntsville. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was thinking um, about um, uh, something that, um, that, that Gautam, I think what both of you were saying, and in a way, um, if the tension for Buford, maybe between the abstraction and representation, which I think you're right, I think he didn't feel that necessarily the tension, um, but that there was some some similar set of questions maybe that arose for Baldwin around um, writing writing in protest or, or not writing in protest, kind of like how, how political is the prose. And, um, and and I think some similar argument might be made close to the thing that you just said, which is if you look at the sentences, if you're actually enmeshed in the texture of the thing he's doing, that the movements are the same. The same. About, you know, that it's, I, there's a lovely quote in, in your book from um, an art critic who says that there's convection in both for Delaney's, you know, there's this kind of movement in the background and the foreground. And, and I think Baldwin also had convection in his prose. Like yes. that's a kind of quality that they, that they shared and there's something, um, there's something about that that carries through no matter what the ostensible topic is. That is mm -hmm. And that that movement, the ability to create that kind of movement is not, um, it's not just technical or something, it, it, is, it, is, it comes out of Baldwin's relationship to the world. Like he, he couldn't do that without, without his relationship to the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we are now going to get to hear the story of the escape to Istanbul. Is oh, that? all right. <laughs> so this is, yeah. Um, this is an account from, from Nick Wiedemann's wonderful biography, Amazing Grace, um, which we drew on extensively here this afternoon, um, of, of being at Buford. This is, this is really a story of James Baldwin and Buford Delaney. James Baldwin lurks in the background of this story, and I have to, I'm embarrassed to say it has to do with me, too. Uh, I'm not reading it to reveal who I am, but uh, really to reveal something of James Baldwin and something of Buford Delaney. James Baldwin had been in Istanbul for several months working on a novel. I was working for him as a secretary assistant, and in June he sent me to New York with part of his manuscript. On the way back, I planned to stop in Paris to take delivery of a car 
I had bought. Baldwin asked that I collect a friend named Richard in London on my way to Paris. And then in Paris, I pick up Buford Delaney. I knew Richard as an eccentric young poet of Armenian, Russian, English ancestry, whom Baldwin had met in London earlier in the year. I had only heard of, but not met Buford, and asked Baldwin to describe him. He's a cross between Br'er Rabbit and St. Francis of Assisi, he said. <laughs> and he sent me on my way. I should have learned from that, but I was in trouble. And on July 1st, having deposited Richard with a cousin of his in Paris and picked up my car, I made my way to 50G Rue vessin I found a Zola-esque courtyard guarded by an ancient female concierge dressed in black. She pointed to the corner entryway when I asked for Monsieur Delaney, and I climbed several stories passing dark, sour-smelling corridors before reaching the landing on which there was a door with a note announcing in bold script, Welcome, David. <laughs> Clearly, Jimmy had warned his friend of my coming. I knocked on the door, and a soft, musical voice answered, Come in, David. The vision that greeted me can only be called mysterious. There was whiteness everywhere. The walls and furniture were covered with sheets, and the carrier of the voice was dressed in a white shirt and white trousers. In the midst of all that whiteness was a round, dark, quizzical, but smiling face illuminated by the yellow sunlight that poured through the large window. I thought of Baldwin's description and of St. Francis in his hermitage. After his greeting, Buford's first words to me were, won't you lie down? <laughs> Somehow at the time, the suggestion accompanied by a gentle movement of one hand toward a sheet draped cot along the wall didn't seem strange. I immediately lay down on the cot, and Buford reclined on the one in line with mine along the east wall. Essentially, we stayed head to head on those cots for three days and nights except for visits to the latrine in the outside corridor and brief moments of canned tuna nourishment. Sometimes we slept, but when we did not, we talked. Buford knew why I was there, but he had no intention of getting into a car with me to drive anywhere until he knew who I was and I knew who he was. Day and night had little effect on our interview. Sometimes Buford's soft voice came out of the darkness, sometimes out of the light. We talked about everything, our childhoods, our loves, our work. Baldwin, the artist's difficult quest for survival. We talked about life as an apprenticeship rather than an end. About the works of Proust, about Zen. Buford's was a sad but loving voice, soft with a slight southern melody to it. It was a voice that probed difficult and even painful places. When the three days were over and Buford said, Shall we go to Jimmy now? As if he were across the street. I felt at once exhausted and somehow sated, as if we had had three days and nights of energetic intimacy. Before leaving, I asked to see the paintings, and when the sheets were lifted, was given my first showing of the art of Buford Delaney. An amazing profusion of yellow abstractions intermingled with extraordinary portraits whom the painter identified as Walter Anderson, James Baldwin, Bernard Hassel, and many others. We picked up Richard and started out. The trip was a terrifying experience. I had been told nothing of Buford's paranoia, and his voices had not been included in our three-day conversation. The first day and night were fine, if a bit bizarre, because of Richard's cries of appreciation for odd objects he noticed along the road old shoes, discarded cans and tires. Buford smiled at these remarks. If I had read Baldwin's introduction to the Lambert show, I would have tried to find the light in those objects as well. The first real trouble came in Yugoslavia after a difficult border crossing, difficult because the customs officials were upset by Richard's voided British passport containing his picture at age six <laughs> and because we were an unlikely trio, probably importing drugs. As we drove along the road, Buford, sitting next to me in the front seat, asked in his usual quiet voice, Did you hear what they said? When I inquired who, 
Buford pointed back at the car that had just passed us. Trained in the process of blind reason by years of schooling, I pointed out that given the fact that two cars traveling at 60 miles an hour in opposite directions with the windows closed, and that the people in the other car were almost certainly speaking several Croatian, and if they were speaking anything, Buford could not possibly have heard anything. Well, maybe you didn't hear them, but I did. <laughs> okay, what did they say? They said, look at that old black faggot driving with those two white boys. Buford, those people were Yugoslavian. I don't care what they were, that's what they said, and I'm getting out. I managed to grab Buford by the arm before he could do just that, the car now speeding along with the door unlatched. That night, the three of us fell asleep early on cots, cots lined up side by side in a, in a transit passenger's dormitory, containing perhaps 12 cots for several other men. When I awoke later to find Buford gone, I suddenly understood something strange Baldwin had said before I left. Don't lose him, he urged. Just don't lose him. Outside in the village square, I found my charge, now clearly Br'er Rabbit, accusing the confused but somewhat angry Yugoslavian villagers of trying to kill him. I took Buford back into the dormitory and did the only thing short of tying him up I could do to both sleep and not lose him again. I got into his cot with him, and together in each other's arms we held off the voices, which by now I had begun to hear too. I wondered what kind of picture we must have made to the men staring at us the next morning, an elderly black man of 65 and a white man of 29 who looked 18, wrapped in each other's arms in bed. No one seemed to care, however, and we finally arrived in Istanbul on July 7th. Itself, or of Istanbul itself on those paintings. Um, Hubert wasn't influenced that way by, by where he was, except to the extent that, uh, let's say, if he was visiting Baldwin in Saint Paul de Vence, he might paint a scene, a sort of townscape or villagescape of Saint Paul de Vence. Or if he was in Paris, because he, he also did cityscapes all through his career along with portraits and abstractions. So he did all of these all through his career. In Istanbul, it was mainly people, as far as I can remember. Uh, he did a portrait of me, he did a portrait of Baldwin, he did a portrait of Richard. Um, I don't remember offhand if he ever did a cityscape of Istanbul. Maybe you know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, may I ask? Um, of course, it's the inevitable question, and it's all this whole uh, amazing talk about Baldwin and legacy. And now we come to the question of Buford Laney. The uh, Baldwin is done in '45, right? Is that true? This Baldwin over here uh, of Buford? Oh, this is later, '65. Ah, '65. So it, it's a, it's a question of a subconscious artist like myself 
what have Newford Delaney's relationship been to the New York School of Paintings? Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, abstractions I'm seeing might have been something you would, uh, just before Jackson Pollock started throwing paint. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is, uh, I have, there's, there's a lot in the question because last night, uh, Jamaica Kincaid was saying that she felt for James Baldwin because James Baldwin was a great artist, but because he felt obliged to represent black life, the prosaic, it kept him from doing the things that she felt he would have done if in a different world, which were freer, more uh, what have you. I'm looking and wondering, trying to get past my own art historical indoctrination mm -hmm. as, to, as of about development. Mm -hmm. Do any of you have, and particularly ma'am, a, a feeling about Delaney's relationship, conversation with the New York School mm -hmm. of, of Modernism? Yeah. And maybe where his, where his legacy is now. Right. Um, I'll just say something quick and then um, you can tell me the details better than I can. Uh, well, um, he was actually a little ahead of his time, a little ahead of the abstract expressionist, and didn't get a lot of um, recognition for it until um, the late 40s when everybody else was. Um, and I would, I would contend that he was much freer um, because he was isolated in a sense, um, in the way he worked, the way he you know, um, socialized. I mean, he was around a lot of the um, other artists, but he was pretty much doing his own thing, trying to, you know, he was trained by this abstract, I mean, by this um, impressionist, which again, I will say, you know, for American painters, that's not something that they were looking at necessarily then. And so I think that he was already freed up um, and then came into that. And so the figures, again, sometimes are often, um, he went back and forth all throughout his life, really, with, um, you know, the figurative and the abstract. And I'll say, you know, something to hang the paintings on because there's never that really comfortable, especially with African American artists, it wasn't that comfortable space for abstraction. But as soon as you put a brown person in your painting and you're brown, then that becomes, you know, a political basically. I mean, it becomes an issue that you are, um, that you're seen in a certain way. And I think that he was um, not hiding out um, downtown, but he was trying to be free. He was trying to free up his mind from that, but he didn't seem, he didn't seem afraid to um, put brown people in his paintings, but he knew what the implications were. And, and he, the New York School, I mean, talking to him about painting and hearing about the earlier, so I wasn't around in the early years, obviously, but uh, he never talked about them. He, talk, he talked more about, uh, well, the fact that he learned a little bit from Benton that the art with art students leave, mm -hmm. uh, and that he liked Stuart Davis, mm -hmm. that he um, really admired the European painters, mm -hmm. um, especially Matisse, I'd say, if I had to choose one. Mm -hmm. that the Cezanne. Cezanne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, it doesn't, I can't make that connection. Well, but there's, I mean, I think there's a connection in antecedents, if not in because it is something that you bring out, I think, a lot in your book, that the um, Stieglitz, Alfred Stieglitz was really important to Delaney. Yeah. They were good friends, and he spent a lot of time in American plays. And so he was seeing this stuff that was an influence on the New York School of Painters. John Marin. Yeah, right. he loved right. John Marin. He was going all the time to see. He, mm -hmm. he thought Marin was a, was a kind of ultimate painter. And they, they spent a lot of, he went to lectures on modernism. He spent a lot of time kind of tracking mm -hmm. down things that Stieglitz told him to read. So, that was a real way that a lot of, of abstraction kind of made its yeah. way into... But you don't see direct influence. But, but, but I'm just thinking yeah, that right. like, there's a way in which yeah. he's formed in some of the same ways, yeah. or by some of the same influences mm -hmm. right. that the New York School was, so mm -hmm. that even if there's not a direct right. communication, right. there's a way in which he's coming out of a similar um, set of inquiries. Yeah. But, and then I, I also think, in terms of legacy, that he's shamefully neglected as, as an abstract painter. Like, that that's something that, that you've also said that he, he never gets mentioned if there's a sort of discussion of people who moved into abstraction in the 40s and early 50s. Mm -hmm. it, it, he doesn't, he's not in the same breath. Still to this day. Yeah. Yeah. For, for instance, Stieglitz, who, who liked him and encouraged him, uh, never asked him to show yeah. at all. 
Uh, good afternoon. There was one portrait that you guys showed. Uh, it was amongst the first uh, three. It was like a full body silhouette. Oh, the dark rapture portrait. Yeah, right. right. That's I wonder if you guys 11. can expand on that one. Number eleven. Yeah. I can tell you an interesting story about that. Yeah. You're, we're talking about dark rapture. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is. This is the one, right? Yeah. yeah. There was a, uh, a woman who called me out of the blue. I guess she had heard that I was writing um, a book about James Baldwin. And she called me and she said, in my attic, I have two paintings by that black man that you're writing about. And I would like them out of my house. Uh, I said, not fine. You know? <laughs> 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 uh, so I took two friends uh, who are collectors, and um, indeed there was uh, on the floor, of, lying down flat on the floor of the attic was um, were two, in fact, Washington Square paintings, much like the ones you showed before the garbage. Thing. Beautiful painting, big. And then there was this. Uh, portrait of dark, called Dark Rapture in the back. And I realized quickly who had painted the, all three paintings. Uh, because, well, they were obviously Buford and Lamy paintings, and they were signed in any case. So I uh, suggested to my art collector friends that they take them off her hands, which, uh, you know, for some money, I mean, to steal them. Uh, but, uh, it turned out that I, I looked at the painting and I realized I began to put things together. And on the back of the Dark Rapture painting, it said to my friend so and so. Uh, I can't remember the name, well, I can't, but it's to my friend blank, okay. It turned out that was the woman's husband. And she didn't know it, but I knew from the name that he had been a lover of Baldwin's in Greenwich Village in the early days of the... Uh, so maybe she had some other reason for being money. <laughs> um, but then I looked at the painting and um, I, I saw James Baldwin's body. I mean, it, it's... Uh, Unfortunately, it, it is not a silhouette. Yeah. Um, it's not completely in silhouette. There's a lot of color in that central torso yeah. section that doesn't come out in this reproduction, but... Um, I mean, it was clear to me that's who it was. And then yeah. I remember hearing a story uh, from Baldwin about um, when he was 15 or 16 and gone to the village that there was a friend, a, a girl who was maybe 15 or 16 who wanted her picture painted nude. Well, Buford was very embarrassed by nudity, in any case, he called it nakedness. Uh, he was very shy. and. Uh, he, this girl finally convinced him to let uh, to, to paint a portrait of her, which he did. But she was also a girlfriend of Baldwin's at that time. And Jimmy went with girls and boys at that time. And um, he, she said, you should paint Jimmy. And uh, he also was embarrassed by making this. And, but he agreed, and Buford painted him. As far as I know, there are the only two new paintings here. Mm -hmm. yeah, Hello. You want to here? Yes. Hi. My name is Glory Brown Marshall, and I'm a writer um, and uh, activist, and I do things like that. But what I what I write about are racial justice issues, and looking at the issue of race. And I had this question last night as well with Jamaica Kincaid um, in particular and the love of the racial um, self, the racial identity, the cultural self. Um, was that part of James Baldwin's, was it, was race for him a, a burden? Was no. his blackness a burden? Was the culture something he embraced? Or was the oppression that came with the race so much that it made having the race, having him being African American or Negro or colored at that time, something that was overwhelmingly negative. How did know. he see himself in his racial identity? I don't know of anyone who was more at ease in his racial identity than James Baldwin was. 
he just didn't like people identifying or categorizing him and seeing him only in a racial context. But on the other hand, he loved he loved everything about his race. I mean, the, the, the way that Buford did too. If you look at that painting of um, the, the jazz musicians, uh, the, there's in that painting there's also a love of black people Hi. doing something, uh, doing jazz. Um, no, I think in both cases they were not great. They did not hate themselves as black people or look down on their own blackness at all. I mean, I never got that sense in, in spending a lot of time that I wrote with both of them that that was an issue at all. Wasn't there a quote that Baldwin says, um, I know I'm black? Um, no, there's a quote that I quote. When somebody asked him in a question and answer period uh, about um, the Negro problem, quote, and he said, this, it's not a Negro problem, it's a white problem. I, I'm only black because you think you're white, but that doesn't mean I can't like the food that my culture makes or the dance that my culture does or the music that my culture makes or the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he believed, and Buford did too, that people had to see through that to the human being. Um, but every human being has to have a vehicle to live in. And they were happy with the vehicle they lived in. And they were great optimists, both of them. Both of them, yeah. Really yeah. optimistic yeah. about the possibilities. Yeah. I saw some hands in the back there. I'm not sure who's in charge of the microphone. Or... Um, the whole idea of Jim Bowen becoming a writer and uh, using uh, more than locomotion, um, the whole idea of him using movement in his work, uh, such as uh, the end of Sunday's Blues, where he says that glass stood and shook above my brother's head, like the very uh, cup of trembling. Uh, did he get that from Buford Delaney? Very important quote: um, the glass of milk uh, above the, the head of the, the piano player, like a very picture of trembling. Is oh, that, right. Yeah, it's a beautiful quote. A very cup of trembling. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is the question? Yeah, he's asking if if, if he might have uh, taken that from the lady. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, this idea of the, the movement within things. The, the yeah, the, the the cup of milk is a very uh, cup of trembling. Cup of trembling. Yeah, I know, I know, and I know about the cup of trembling, but what, what was I, that coming from Delaney, do you think? Oh, I see. It's yeah, a question of movement, movement in sayings or something. Uh -huh. The cup of trembling came from the, from Baldwin's own church experience, I think, from, uh, you know, the old songs. I, I, I don't know that it came from Buford, particularly. Uh, I'm wondering if he's thinking of the um, the vibration of color in um, you know particularly in yellow, but then also when the, the bright colors that he uses and how he draws the lines, several different colored lines around things that sort of has a vibration um, to it and movement and yeah, and I mean. Yeah, of, of the way things are reflected in the way. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have three very quick things, and perhaps you answered this, and I, I missed it, uh, but for purpose of clarification, were De Buford and Baldwin ever lovers? It's, no, I, I think not. Uh, Buford, I always said that from the first, day he met Jimmy, when he opened the door and he came in, he fell in love with him. And, and I think he was, yeah, physically attracted to him, but Baldwin was not physically attracted to him, uh, at least not in those, well, never, basically. So 
So no, they were not open. Okay. Secondly, with the uh, connection with the color yellow, uh, the one thing you did not miss, uh, did not clarify, was that yellow is also the color of the sun. Uh, light. Uh, so to the extent it's the color of the sun, the sun is the giver of life. Yeah. The sun makes things grow. The sun gives warmth. So from a positive point of view, um, you know, yellow is a very attractive color. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, David, you and I met uh, on the phone a few years ago, having been introduced by the um, actor Charles Reese. Oh, okay. I told you I had negotiated the release of all of Buford's paintings from the warehouse in, in France in 1980. I just wanted everyone here to, to realize, and this is a comment on the very special relationship that seems to exist between African-American talent and the country of France, that the warehouse owners agreed to release all of the paintings for no fee. Um, and those paintings had been stored in the warehouse for years after uh, Buford's death. This was the, uh, the paintings that became, that were shown at the Studio Museum in Harlem. It's those paintings we're referring to. Didn't they also take over some of his medical expenses at some point? Yes, yeah. the French government. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, what was your relationship to him? Were you, you were the lawyer, the negotiator? I'm a lawyer, Joseph, the lady who brought it to you that asked me to negotiate the warehouse of France. Right. Um, I want to thank David and um, Deidre and um, Rachel for this amazing panel. Thank you so much. I have a question, number one, to the question over here about Baldwin's you know, volume of his racial pride. Um, I invite you, you know, to read Baldwin and also come to Jimmy and I Noon, where it's, he's one of the most sophisticated people about the mythology of race, right? The invented quality of race. So I invite you to kind of read his work. But I want, didn't want to I leave here. I can't read his work. Okay, but I'm, I'm, this question started me. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, us not to leave that scene that I'm writing about. Um, on the highway, right? When Buford says, what is this black patio? You know, this to white men. You mentioned the beginning about that sedimented history that comes out in his illness. But can we talk both about Buford's mental frailty, but also Baldwin's psychic trauma as well? How do we parse that? I mean, we, we can't leave the hanging in the air, it seems to me. That major quote we just read. But how do we think about Baldwin's suicide attempts, you know, Buford's, you know, imbalance? But also that incredibly revealing quote about the black family for those two white men. That's a very complicated question. Um, yeah, well, the quote is very revealing. I mean, it reveals what was, if you, if you read his journals uh, over the years, and his, if you read about his attempted suicide, uh, I don't know whether he knows about it, uh, at one point, he wanted to take a trip to Greece, and uh, the voices followed him as he took the train from Paris uh, to Brindisi, um, and uh, they took all his they took his his well-being, his sense of himself. He he finally, in fact, uh, collapsed in Brindisi, and the police simply threw him onto the boat <coughs> to go to Patras in Greece. And he got to Patras. He was all right as he was drinking in the bar because he was drunk the whole time. But when he got to Patras, uh, the voices caught up with him again, called him a faggot. Or they sometimes used the word, he used the word, but faggot, queer, uh, nigger. They called him all of these things. Uh, and finally he couldn't stand it anymore. So he went to one side of the boat and threw his keys, his passport, uh, his overcoat, everything into the water. And then he went to the other side of the ship, knowing he couldn't swim, jumped off, uh, and was drowning when the fishermen picked him up and took him to Greece, and eventually he ended up in the hospital in Paris. And uh, the quote that I used in, the, in what I just read reveals as do all of the journals, that those were the two things that uh, he was most uncomfortable with. Now, 
Does that mean he was uncomfortable being a black man? No, he was uncomfortable with what was being, what had been done to him as a black man. Was he uncomfortable with being homosexual? Maybe. Um, he was very shy about sex. He was very uh, wary of it. Um, in the case of Baldwin's relationship to that, Baldwin's reaction was very different. I mean, he he had been oppressed by racism. He had been oppressed by uh, homophobia. Um, but uh, he fought against it in a different kind of way. And his mental problems, I think, had very little to do uh, with his being black. Uh, he, too, had several what now what would have been called then minor nervous breakdowns. But uh, if anything, they were to do with betrayals, personal betrayals, uh, which, yes, had to do with homosexuality, but not with his homosexuality, but with the fact that he felt betrayed by lovers who are usually not homosexual themselves, but were using him because of his fame and so on. I wonder if this is something they talk um, among themselves a lot about, like these... Um, you mean Buford in general? Mm -hmm. um, they did. Um, I guess in your presence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, 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 um, I actually became a good enough friend of both of them so that uh, things were talked about. but. Um, and I had my own uh, story to tell, which, you know, which would, would not be a simple story. Um, but they did talk about it, not in great detail. Neither one of them, interestingly enough, although Baldwin in his writing was capable of being explicit uh, sexually, in their actual conversation, they were rarely, they didn't do any sort of um, explicit jocular talk about uh, sex, but they would talk about the issue of being gay and the issue of being black and the effect on their lives. Mm -hmm. Comparing, for instance, uh, both of them are free preachers, sons, uh, growing up in different atmospheres, one in Knoxville, one in uh, Harlem, but both of them in societies which would have no truck at all for uh, it, you know, for uh, homosexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, we have reached our, our time limit for this uh, outstanding panel. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.